As we also discussed last meeting, uh, the legislature and the governor this year approved um, an additional allocation for early childhood for the first time in over a decade. Uh, it was a little under $20 million. It funded three things. First, it funded a set of four-year-old seats that we were going to lose. So that we're doing the best on four-year-olds, we were going to go backwards on four-year-olds without this allocation uh, as there were federal dollars expiring. They filled that hole. And happy to say we maintained steady for fours, which is great news for kids and families. Second, um, as we've discussed extensively in this group, uh, the main funder of seats for anything other than LA4 and the four-year-old program is what we call at the department's CCAP, or the Child Care Assistance Program, which funds child care in type three centers um, for low-income families that are working and going to school. And uh, there are a number of challenges with that program. Most notably, we don't have enough money to fund all of the families and children that need to take advantage of it. So we have, for a couple of years now, had a pretty sizable wait list. This past year, it was over 5,000 families. And then even at the families we were serving, uh, the rate of the, um, the voucher was so low that oftentimes families couldn't make up the difference between the amount that could be supported and the amount that the center charged, which then makes the limited amount of money we had not so useful. And so uh, the legislature did, and the governor did two things on that front. First, uh, they helped us raise the rate to the 25th percentile of the market. So previously, um, our subsidies would have given children access to about one in five centers across the state in big cities, fewer than one in 10. Now, the CCAP uh, payment covers one in four centers across the state. That's still not where we wanna be, but it's a really important step forward. Uh, that goes, uh, that becomes real for our centers and families in about a week. That policy becomes final and uh, our providers and our families will see a quantifiable difference in the amount they are funded for, which is really, really an exciting step for Louisiana. And second, um, related to CCAP, as I mentioned, we had that 5,000 family wait list going into the legislative session. Uh, the legislature and the governor funded roughly 1,400 additional seats for children on that wait list, specifically focused on, I think in large part due to this commission, uh, seats for children birth to three, which again is where we have that greatest need for service. Um, of those 1,400 seats, uh, we have pulled at this time uh, over 2,000 children off the wait list. And by that I mean we have called those families, we have said, good news, there's money, we can help you, let's, you know, let's get moving. Um, and we've been able to process 930 of those children to be authorized to go use their service. The reason for that difference is important to talk about. Sometimes that means families have, you know, their income has improved and they've moved that eligibility, which is great news for Louisiana families. To be the leaders, to be the group that when I talk to my neighbors, if I say Ready, Start, Baton Rouge, they know, oh, that's that group that's thinking about in Baton Rouge, what is our long-term vision and plan around serving early childhood birth to five in a more comprehensive and high-quality way in there today. And you can imagine that just having more traction and scale than my small but mighty team here in Baton Rouge trying to ourselves drive change across 1,500 sites and tens if not hundreds of thousands of kids. Um, and so we certainly have a lot of work to do as well, but we believe deeply that local leaders um, carry way more cachet and ability to bring together local coalitions to build a vision that is specifically tailored to the challenges of their community frankly, to raise local funds to help support that work and to drive change in a more nuanced way, community to community. Because the reality is, and you'll hear more about this, the challenges of Iberville are different than the challenges of East Carroll, which are certainly different than the challenges of Caddo or Calcasieu. And so we are at a point now that the base coordination and organization work has happened in every corner of the state to say, it's time for something more nuanced. It's time for us to really address the places that have no child care options versus the places that just have sites that really need a lot of support to be even better versus the sites that have really great sites and they're just busting at the seams and they don't have any more seats. Those are different challenges and they need to be addressed in different ways. The legislation specifically asked these Ready Start pilots 
to do a number of things. Um, you see those listed here, and we'll talk about them in much greater detail as part of the panel, so I'm not going to walk through each of them. The, but the basic premise being, you should have a vision for what you want to be true in a year, three years, five years in your community, and a plan to move your local community to, you know, towards success against that vision. We have asked our Ready Start networks uh, to do four core things, and you'll hear them talk about this today. First, we have asked them to build a blueprint. That is a different way of saying build your vision. Put a stake in the ground and say, in Jefferson Parish, under the leadership of Sorrentha, what's going to be true a year from now, three years from now, five years from now, when it comes to the number of seats we have and how good those seats are. We've asked them to think about and build coalitions. So we will never solve this problem if the only people who are at the table are the educators who serve our youngest learners. That will never work. We have to bring business and industry. We have to bring philanthropy. We have to bring general community members that can be engaged and want to be involved. And we have to have parents at the table. Third, we've asked them to think about governance. If these groups are going to have more authority over time to build that plan, and to execute the dollars to make sure that the right seats are getting expanded in the right places and the right quality supports are happening, we need to make sure there are fair rules and guidance around how do those decisions get made. Is there transparency here? In much the same way that you would have transparency in K-12, you know, those are public meetings where big discussions are happening about budgets and dollars, that same thing needs to be true in early childhood. And frankly, it needs to be built in a way that invests Head Start Child Care and Pre-K to all be players together holding hands and solving this problem. And then finally, um, I do think, as we've talked about extensively in this group, this is going to take dollars to solve this problem. That is just a fact. We continue at the department to go after every federal dollar we can get. We will continue to do that. Um, the state legislature and the governor have stepped up in big ways to start to make traction on the state dollars that we can invest here. This commission has asked for more, and you know, that discussion I'm sure will continue. But also there are local level opportunities to bring dollars to the table. Orleans is a primary example of this. Policy Institute was very heavily involved in that, and you all can certainly speak to it. But um, there are ways to bring together city councils, mayor offices, and local philanthropy and businesses to help contribute to the specific challenges of the community. We see it as our job at the department to bring together technical assistance, supports, and a set of guardrails, if you will, to set up our Ready Start leaders to do these four things well, so that Sorrentha can build and execute the vision in Jefferson, or Cindy can build and execute the vision in Rapides in a way that brings together a broader coalition of people that help them make that real. So I'm excited for you to hear them talk about that. You see on the next slide what we call the full model. These are just greater details about each of those four major pillars that I talked about. Again, I'm not going to read this to you, but for background, you'll hear them talk about what this means in practice as part of the panel. I'll say just a couple more things, and then I want to turn it over to the, the real uh, boots on the ground leaders here. Um, you know, we imagine as Ready Starts come to life, they represent an opportunity to drive more nuanced change in quality to really meet all providers where they are um, at scale, and also to make sure we're expanding seats in the ages, zip codes, and places we most need them, nuanced to the communities that are served and the families that need service. But you can also imagine a world when I like really go to my most um, audacious dreaming of this, that Ready Starts become such a known thing. There are examples of this in other states where as a mother of very young children, sort of lost about who do I go to for what, this becomes a hub. They may not be the provider of all of the things listed here, but they become the entity that knows who does what and can connect me with a number of resources that I might need, be that um, medical, be that school, be that um, community broadly. Uh, there's just a lot of opportunity here to have our, some of our strongest leaders who know the most about developing young hearts and minds um, have the, the leadership and platform to be able to bring others along and further elevate really good work that's happening separate and apart from this space. 
because the reality is Ready Starts and community networks at this point run enrollment events. They are the, probably the most likely entity in every community to interact with the parents of the youngest children in that community on some regular basis. We should take advantage of that as a state and use it as an opportunity to solve for not just the educational um, components that children need birth to five, but any number of other resources and supports that would benefit um, our young children and families. Yeah, sure. Uh, I guess my question would be from the governor, governance perspective, did this reside, does it still reside at the Department of Education, or do you envision the Ready Start Network taking over some of the governance? And at some point, does the the Ready Start Network start to function like a, a local school board, or is that not the intent? Yeah, it's a good question, um, and certainly the you know panelists should jump in as well. I think um, the department will inevitably always have a role because we are um, defining the bar for excellence, running the accountability system, and allocating the dollars. I think what is so exciting to me about Ready Start, among other things, though, is in a world where Cindy is facilitating. Um, a group of local leaders to say, here's what we know about who we're serving and how well. Here's what we need to do. How can we take these dollars and disseminate them in a way that protects diverse delivery and makes sure we continue to have infant and toddler care and also make sure that we're expanding quality and access all at the same time? Their ability to do that in nuanced ways locally is just frankly better than you know, our team in Baton Rouge looking at spreadsheets and deciding that. There's a lot of momentum that I think comes from that work. So I think there continues to be a role for both, but I hope increasingly over time, uh, when people, uh, and this is by the way already true to a large degree, when people think about the early childhood plan of Rapids Parish, the thing they should be thinking about is Cindy Rushing and, and the governance team she builds, not not the Department of Education, and we're here to support and to make sure there are guardrails to protect kids, dollars, all the things on the back end. So they, if, I'm, if I'm hearing correctly, I think the governance would still stay with the Department of Education, but the boots on the ground, daily efforts, and, and within some, some degree of flexibility to be at the Ready Start Network level. Yeah, and uh, Best Member Davis should speak to this as well when he's um, speaking later, but I, th I imagine uh, in the near term, Bessie will um, need and want to promulgate a set of basic regulations that say, Ready Starts, here's what we want you to achieve over the course of a year, three years. Here are sort of the parameters in which you need to work. And beyond those parameters, y'all run. Go solve the early childhood challenges of given parishes in much the same way that with school systems we say, here are the basic guardrails, here's what we want you to achieve, and the specific academic plans of East Baton Rouge look different than the plans of St. Tammany, which look different than the plans of Madison. I don't know if that's answering your question, but. And so, so Bessie would have the authority to promulgate those rules for the Ready Start Network. Yes. Okay. And then I think there's value, since, since we are kind of on a, a new field, not new, I mean this is existing, right, but we have the ability to make this the best we can make it. We can look at national models, and so is that something that the department's looking at and say, how are other states doing this? And, you know, maybe the school board model, you know, should be replicated, or maybe it shouldn't, or maybe there are changes that can be made. Is, is that this? Is that like national scope kind of being looked at? It is. Yes, absolutely. Um, I would say. Uh, there are elements of Head Start that do this that we can learn from, and there are states like Florida, for example, that have created these, um, for them, county-based um, entities. They call them FSCs. I always forget what that stands for, but essentially it's like their version of Ready Start to say, what is our local plan on serving our youngest children, and how are we driving that forward year to year? They are, so I have a friend who lives in Florida. That is a known thing. She knows what her FSC is. That is something that has good, like warm feelings in the community. They believe in that vision and people can point you to that for service for young kids. I think this is, again, many of our Ready Starts are doing this work. It's just quiet. We're trying to give them a platform even more than they already have to say those are the leaders. We're gonna help and support them and make that real. Um, and we're certainly leaning on other places that have done this as well. But I will say, um, it is surprising in 2019, uh, 
how unique it still remains, the work that many of the individuals in this room have done around early childhood to bring together Head Start Child Care and Pre-K. I would say it is not the norm in most states that those entities work together in the collaborative way that they do in Louisiana, which presents an opportunity for us to lead. It also comes with the challenge of, you know, we're designing this and there aren't endless models for us to pick and choose from the quality, which is why we're so grateful for the pilots for help, for being real partners with us in this and with Bessie to, um, to define, build, and iterate on this as we build them up. Good afternoon, uh, Paul Lucia with uh, Barry Cherry Trade and Chair for the Department of Education's Advisory Council. So, Jessica, do you envision basically those sort of guardrails as you mentioned? Um, would the commission or the advisory board sort of have input on that? You know, my fear is just that, you know, I know I personally work with one of the best Ready Start Networks Jefferson. <laughs> so, you know, I, I know how we function, but for those who may, um, you know, I just wanted to see sort of that, what that process looks like. Yeah, absolutely. I'm going to use it to, um, well, I was already there, surprised, didn't know that a bunch of many times. Um, so we have built, we've done two cohort pilots now. Cohort one has been in action for about five months-ish. Um, cohort two was just named about a month ago. Uh, so this is still very, very fresh, as you all know. We're still learning a lot as we go. But I do think within um, the next six to 12 months, we will have seen enough of this come to light and take shape to be able to um, codify in a more firm way what the long-term structural elements of this need to be. Very similar to when Act 3 was passed in 2012, we started with pilots. We knew what we wanted to achieve. Everybody was clear on the sort of ambition of the long-term vision. We have to see how that plays out right before we want to over-regulate something to death out of the gate. But yes, I think ultimately Bessie will need to, um, including per the legislation, pass a set of guardrails, for lack of a better word, that says, here's the basic frame. We expect you to do these four things. Here are sort of the rules of the game with the dollars and quality. And um, I imagine that will happen in the next six to 12 months. And I guess, I, um, you might have answered this question. Would that be a role of this commission, like a subcommittee of this commission, of some of the shareholders, maybe having that next year as a, at once they've kind of gotten off the ground and you've seen them working? Yeah, so the, um, the department has um, an advisory council, which Paul leads, that uh, historically has always weighed in on the regulatory components of early childhood. I think absolutely that group needs to weigh in. But certainly this commission's voice, guidance, um, and expertise would benefit the creation of those, and we would love to keep the whole group in a loop. Yeah. Um, I will just mention a couple more things and then I promise I'm going to pass it over to the, the most exciting speakers today. We did also, there was a question last meeting about where these Ready Starts are and which of our children they're serving. So you can see on our map, with a, a lot of stars and colors, uh, hopefully it's clear from the back. Um, right now, based on the 13 Ready Start pilots that have um, launched, we're reaching about 42% of our economically disadvantaged children birth to four, which for 13 out of 69 parishes is a pretty, or 69, you know, districts is a, a pretty good showing, but we still have a long way to go. And again, very much like Act 3, this started with a, um, a slower churn. We wanted to start with a core group who was ready to run, learn, and give us a bunch of feedback about what's working and what's not, and expand over time, rather than us at the department sort of baking a model and saying, okay, now everybody just go do it overnight. We want to learn too. Um, and we're very grateful for the leaders who have jumped in to help design and build this for something really good in the long term. Um, at this point, we're going to pass it to a set of panelists, again facilitated by Kay, um, that are going to talk through, uh, we have Cindy Rushing, Leslie Hodges, Almicha Franklin, Sorrentha Strickland, and Tony Davis. They're going to talk through what they're doing, what this looks like in practice for them today, today much more specific. Um, we've included here, though, in cohort one, what they're focused on. And again, I'm not going to go through this slide, but the point is, Everybody is driving toward higher quality and expanded access, but you can see out of the gate 
they are going about that differently, which we think is a very good thing. Because again, the challenges of Iberville are not Orleans and are not St. Mary. And so we want to support them to expand access and quality in the way that best serves their community while expecting to see those numbers move over time. So uh, with that, I will, I don't know if we need another agenda item. We do have a new agenda item for this. I think we have to get a receive and then I'm going to pass it to the team to walk us through. I'll make a motion to receive this agenda item. Thank you. All right, so if our panelists can come up to the front, if y'all give us just five minutes to transition and then we'll jump in. just us as our community network 
more than, like Jessica said, beyond the education piece to get the people in there that need to be there. So we've very carefully done that. And then we've always been, you know, as league agency, Rapids Parish School Board is league agency. And we felt like we needed to move up beyond that to become our own network. So we have done a branding campaign and we have rebranded and we have, uh, we uh, just unveiled our new website uh, yesterday at our monthly community network meeting. And it's just a way to do it. Again, we went with local people that have their pulse on what's happening in Rapids and how they can help. So that's been very uh, great for us. And the good thing is that, you know, Jessica talked about resources that families need and how there's not really a place for you to go and get all of that. And so one of the pieces of our, our website is to have like a clearinghouse of resources. Where can a family go to one-stop shop to find the childcare for, for them, to find information about medical, uh, dental, um, mental health, all of those things. So we envision this as being a resource for families. And then on the other hand, continuing to look at that access. And because we know we are serving about less than 10% of the infants in the year. And our toddler numbers are not much better. And so we know the children are there, but they can't access, they can't access that quality care because of, because of their own resources. And so I think it's up to us at the local level to come up with solutions now and to help with uh, finding available seats because we have chapter centers that have available seats <coughs> but they don't have the children because they can't the ones that we need to reach that that are the most in need they're just not able to actually do that you know we serve probably almost 100 percent of our four-year-olds uh, but that's about that's about the only place that we do that so I'm hearing you talk about your eye is on access, your eye is on quality, but right now to get Ready Start off the ground, you've spent a lot of time constructing your coalition, thinking about that and who to go after, how to map that out. Yes. All right, next up, Ms. Almeida Franklin. How are you this I'm afternoon? I'm fine, thank you. And um, Ms. Franklin is the CEO for the St. Mary Community Action Agency also the Head Start program there. And she's um, also the lead agency. They're the lead agency for St. Mary Parish. So you've been involved with us and always want to raise your hand and say, I'll try that. And we thank you for that. Would you talk a little bit about how you view Ready Start as an opportunity to influence your community? Well, because we are a community action agency with the multi-function we are housing, transportation, we do um, a, a variety of child care. We thought that Ready Start would be a perfect vehicle for us to use all of those resources in our community to build a quality, quality care for our early childhood development. Uh, having served <coughs> as a, uh, the lead agency for the community network with the school system, the school district, the, um, child care centers, Head Start, all of us at the table, we found that there were some gaps in our community and we wanted to find out how could we fill those gaps. And Ready Start was, that perfect, was a perfect vehicle for us to do that. We have not gotten as far as the uh, Rapids Parish with our, our planning with our Ready Start program, but we're being very meticulous with it because we want Ready Start to be a complete reflection of our community. Um, we want parents to be at the table. We want um, the uh, financial institutions to bring resources, money to the table. We want the housing industry. We want transportation, even governmental entities to come. So when we get to the place where we need to talk about policies, we'll have some muscle with us when we go to the table. So having said that, um, right now, we're just, we finish our blueprint. We're gonna be looking at where we need to go as it relates to adding what we call tier two, the other stakeholders that are gonna be coming to the table with us. I just see as a community development organization, and we've been doing this work for about 40 years now, 
Ready Start is an excellent opportunity for us to be able to forge a relationship with our community, with our stakeholder, with our parents, all of us working together to <laughs> reach that village concept. Everybody doing their part to make sure that every child had the opportunity to um, a quality uh, education. So that, that, that's what we're looking at. That's our vision. Thank you. And Mr. Rimpa, thank you for participating today. And Sorenda is the Director of Education and Outreach for the Jefferson Collaborative and um, has really assisted us with a lot of thinking through things and we appreciate that. Because you're such a thinker, my question for you is, how has your concept of Ready Start evolved from the time you raised your hand to say, I think we can try this, to where you are in the process right now? What have you learned? <coughs> with you and, and I smile when Kay says I'm a thinker because one of the things I've described um, our Ready Start network as is our collaborative on steroids. So that, that you know, that probably uh, describes me differently than being a thinker, but um, <laughs> we've, um, I, I think we started um, working with the State Department of Education in this very early on and thinking about what the Ready Start network could look like and initially thinking that we have, you know, like the other groups up here, we had a, a huge, wonderful group uh, we call our collaborative, our early childhood collaborative in Jefferson, and we've been doing great work. We've been pulling people together, we've been excited, um, we work with the department to look at our data and we look at our class scores. They are slowly increasing over time and I really credit that to the work of our collaborative. We have a full collaborative that comes together. We were coming together monthly now, pretty much every other month and every provider, um, administrator of childcare, Head Start, school system representatives coming together um, and really using it as a community of practice to learn together. But in addition to that, we've already also had what we call the core leadership team. Because as you can imagine, in a parish the size of Jefferson, when our collaborative comes together, we often have 50, 60, 70 people in the room. So you can accomplish a lot with a group that size, but there are different things you need to accomplish that sometimes require a smaller group. So we've had what we call a core leadership team that are representatives from those different groups who come together regularly. Um, Monique Rouge, Paula Polito are part of our core leadership team. So you can imagine we've had some pretty amazing people coming together who really are thinkers, okay? I can't take any of the credit for the work that's been done because it's really been this collaborative of folks. Um, and we, like I said, have, have really done some things around quality and we really work together as a collaborative to bring things like coaching, collaborative coaching, using evidence-based practices in classrooms, really giving credentials of child care leaders so that they can observe their own teachers, provide quality feedback. We've done a lot of things collaboratively to get where we are. But as we really thought about it, if we were going to move to the next level, we really needed to be very thoughtful, very deliberate about how we bring a different group of leaders to the table. When we get together as program managers, we think very differently than bringing together a group of people who are really trying to think about who are those money people as you reference. How do we deliberately, very thoughtfully bring together a dynamic governance group that really can talk about how to move to the next level or move to the next tier or you know all those kinds of things. How do we find those agents of change, as Jessica referred to them, but what we're calling actually are, at this point, to your reference, we're actually calling them our thought partners. Okay. They are our thought partners about how to move forward to look at and, and really gather the data we because there's data, there's all sorts of different sources of data, and as you know, we've worked with you guys to pull it together to really figure out where those gaps are. 
to really know and confidently be able to say what percentage of children are we serving and at what level of quality. So we have some of that. But we need that group of, of thought partners to come together and what we are doing right now, our uh, initial group has met once. Um, we're meeting again tomorrow. Um, and we're not yet calling them our council. We are calling them a, a group of thought partners coming together. We have engaged Advocacy and Communication Solutions, one of the national consulting groups that the Department of Ed has brought in to work with Ready Start Networks. We've engaged them separately to support us in a strategic planning process. You know, we work together a lot, and one of the things that I've learned from colleagues in other areas, including our colleagues in New Orleans, is the importance of that um, process to have a strategic plan that's grounded in data, that has an articulated vision and mission with then how do we have steps to move forward. So that's a big piece of what we're working on. And despite all the work we've done over five years, we've not actually engaged in a systematic process of strategic planning with vision, mission, and goals. So that's what we kick off tomorrow. And you're here to have it. And so, Leslie Hodges from Washington. Um, Leslie is one of our, what I call our smaller community networks, and she wears many, many hats. And she meets us upcoming in Billings. She was actually upstairs um, this morning filling out um, an application for licensure for one of our classrooms, where she's partnering with Head Start. I wanted to ask you, Leslie, just um, all of your, your panelists here who are with you have spoken about various things. For you doing the work, and y'all have actually moved a lot of work recently, and you're putting in a new classroom, you have all kinds of plans for expanding access. What do you think is important for the commission to know these are purposes? Well, I, I think uh, it's important for the commission to know that Act 3 brought us together as separate entities. But Ready Start is going to take us the next step because it's just re-energized our network. Uh, it has allowed us to work uh, collaboratively uh, using data to assess the needs in the community. We're much different than Jefferson in that we're very small and rural, high level of poverty. But through uh, sharing data uh, with our Head Start partner, Regina Chelly, we, we were able to determine the needs in the area and the number of children that did not have access simply due to the fact that there were no providers. And these are children that are at high risk, many of them with special needs, who really need our help. And this is in that birth to three age group. Uh, we had universal pre-K. We were, at, at, you know, in the very beginning, Washington Parish was out front on that. So we don't need to be worried about the uh, four-year-olds because we're servicing 100% there. But it's the the babies, the infants, the toddlers uh, are only being served in the small town of Franklin. And if you're in an outlying area, it's very difficult for you uh, as a single mother uh, or, and, and for, <coughs> for families in general uh, to find the support and the services that they need in an accessible manner. So we've been working in, uh, towards that end. But Ready Start is going to be the future. Ready Start eventually. We would, like, we would like Ready Start to be like tops. We would like in the community where if someone said, oh, Ready Start, they would have this positive association that this is a good thing for our community. We know what they do. We know what it's all about. And, and as uh, Sarenka was saying, it, it will cover all the services that, young, that families with young children are going to need because these children are our future just as much as the children at the other end that need tops, these babies are going to need Ready Start, and so that's sort of... I like that analogy. <laughs> <laughs> so, Tony, thank you for finding time for us today. And we thought it was important to do with you because you've been involved with early childhood for a number of years, not only as a board member and policy maker, but really in your community as a business leader pushing early childhood. You encourage Mackinac Parish to apply for cohort two. So just talk about what you see as a policymaker, why you think this is important. Sure. Um, 
I want to say, first of all, Liam, with that top analogy, though, and I was just a special note for First Lady over there and Donald in the corner, but keep that in mind. It's a really good thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> just saying, just put it out there. Um, so, yeah, I, I've worked with this uh, a, a good while. I started the Chamber World, and so as a Chamber of Commerce executive, uh, I work with a lot of employers, and many of our largest employers are income drivers in Natchez Parish, and Natchez is uh, a little bit bigger than Rhode Island and 39,000 people spread across all of it. So we have our share of challenges for many things we do, including access to, to quality seats and other childhood. Um, but over the years of working with that, I've become a huge believer uh, in the work you all do, in the work that recognizing how much we need to do and can be doing for our youngest learners, for birth through four, birth through five, but also, as I've gotten into state policy, looking at how many things uh, we think about both in the economy and in the, in the, in the education system. Think of all the things that ails us, so to speak, and how many of those we can solve by putting so much more effort into the first few years of our children's lives. And this is the future, as it was said. This is the future. This model is the future, but these children are our future as well. Their health, their welfare, their well-being uh, is what will be reflected in our entire state as we move forward. We think about uh, on the on the business side of this. I'm so uh, proud of the work we've done in Louisiana. The Policy Institute's driven a lot of that work in terms of getting information on the economic impact that we have with early childhood, or the lack thereof, in terms of access to that. When we look at the um, productivity that's been quantified that we lose here, and, and the hundreds of millions of dollars we think about, we're getting into the the B billions in terms of our economic base that we're losing access to. We think about the number of parents who cannot pursue full-time employment. We think about how many leave employment. We think about how many do not finish higher education. All because of having access or not having access to early childhood. That's huge in a state like this where we need every single dollar. No one in this room will tell us we have enough money. No one. You wouldn't have said it 10 years ago, and unfortunately you may not say it five years from now or 10 years from now. This is the step to take towards making that a reality. We think about our K-12 system, we have lots of challenges in that system. But some of those challenges involve having children at different levels within the classroom and the work that these teachers have to go through to help make sure that we get every child ready for the next level. We have a lot of amazing teachers who can get a, a, a student from one grade to the next, that's what they do. But it's asking a lot to get them to move them up two or three years in one year. If we do more in the first few years of our children's lives, we know we can prepare them in their kindergarten at a very similar place in first grade, a very similar place in second grade. And our teachers will do what they do best and they'll make them excellent as they move through those levels. But we've got to do that work for the first few years. And so uh, I've just become a believer in this and seeing it come together. And, and I truly believe it. Looking at my own experience at Natchitoches, as we worked in Natchitoches, we took work with the Chamber, which gave access to the business community, utilized the school readiness tax credits. Our business <coughs> referral agency is associated and affiliated with the university. They became a partner as the university. It's an education university. So, so did the College of Education. They became involved in our work. It was so important to Natchez, the mayor of Natchez said, you know what, I think we're gonna have somebody on my payroll who helps augment this work in early childhood. So we have a municipal employee who works in early childhood in Natchez. With Act 3 and moving uh, all these entities together, the school board became the lead agency in Natchez, who had assistance from the r and and assistance from the city of Natchez in terms of this employee who works through this. Uh, we have the leadership meetings that come together once a month, everyone's at the table, and then you augment that with myself, Kevin Development, major employers, the mayor, the university, and its presence. And we have built a very strong network organically. The Ready Start Network model is how we can cement that model and make it even better in Natchez, but it's how we create that model around our state. As was referenced earlier, we're not going to have enough money at the state level. The money is not going to come out of Baton Rouge to make this problem better, to address this in its entirety. But by having strong and respected groups at the local level, and all these ideas that we're talking about already, and there's so many more, by having this strong model at the local level, we'll start getting the philanthropic dollars involved. We'll have people who say, I can invest in that. I believe in that. I see where it's going. I know the people involved. I'll make that happen. They'll be a part of that. Having our biggest and most recognizable names in the industry involved in this will go a long way, not only in the terms of what it means for us in Louisiana, Think of how many companies do business in Louisiana that do business in other states. And they're going to turn around and say, hey, you know what we're doing in Louisiana? Why aren't you doing it here? Well, we're located in these other places. What has that happened before? <laughs> we have a tremendous model. And my kudos goes to the Department of Education, Jessica and your team, Kay, everyone, on the work that's going into this. This is not something, this was referenced earlier, a 
think somewhat modestly that this is not something we see or where else. Representative Hilberty asked about the models and you know looking at what's been created. There's not a lot that's been created. We're creating it. And the folks up here, you all work with the no networks around the state, are creating that. We're going to get some amazing ideas out of that. And I think that this, this came up also in reference to uh, Bessie, but it's a bit of a game of semantics. We think about oversight and accountability and governance. And I think that what we're looking at is how can we provide that oversight and some accountability. The key here is having the local governance to this, of having someone autonomous groups at the local level say, do we know what's best for us? We collectively are sitting around the table making these decisions. It's our job at a higher level to say, let's just make sure that what you think is best for you doesn't go too far left or too far right. We have some level here, and that we know you're moving forward. That we have metrics that say you're not just coming together and running, but that you're running a race and you're going to try to win this thing. And so I think we have a role to play in that, and there's certainly a lot of discussions to be had as we move forward in all those areas. Thank you. Thanks for that. So I know y'all have been really patient and good listeners, and you probably have some questions or comments, so I'd like to uh, Michael Tipton with the Blue Cross Foundation. So I guess one of my questions is sort of to that last point around metrics. So these are our pilots. So when we're looking at what differentiated success here and makes these successful, what were we looking at as we sort of go forward to think about what success would look like in scaling this up? What, what are those metrics? Is it number of seats? Is it percentage served? Is it sort of nuance uh, partnerships? So our vision at the department is that we would see increased access and increased quality at a faster rate than you would see if you weren't already. Can I into that? Yeah. Into that? So I think that, yes, that's the answer. But it's important to think about how many, kind of back to the locals looking at this, there are so many factors that go into how you get more seats and how you increase the quality in those seats. And that is where one size is not at all. So I think that, that certainly it's an easy backstop to say we want to have increase access to seats and we'll have higher quality of seats. Uh, but it goes back to the power of having a local group that says here to challenge us, whether it's how far reaching it is in Washington Parish to get, you know, how, how close is access? Um, how many seats are defined? Do we know how many seats are out there? And we cannot dictate that from Baton Rouge level. So I think the easiest metrics are indeed access to and quality, but I don't want to be oversimplified in all the variables that go into creating that access, that quality. Other comments? Also, we're working towards becoming a nonprofit 
ourselves as a, a, so that we are have a greater ability to access uh, funding for some of the uh, expansion that we know we need to do to serve the Walker community and to serve East Alabama. I know what's next in Jefferson. I'll be there. I have to leave the house at 5 in the morning. <laughs> <laughs> I'm to get there. But talk about what's on your agenda because I think that's important. Well, the biggest part of our agenda tomorrow the biggest part of our agenda tomorrow is, is um, around strategic planning, developing the vision, the mission, um, so that we can then go back to our core leadership and our collaborative and really think about the goals and objectives to make it happen for the next <coughs> year. Um, I think, and as Monique and I even talked just before this meeting, you know, one of the big pieces uh, that we think will be part of our process is looking at how do we um, use data to go after local dollars, in fact, uh, local tax dollars. Um, we're jealous of our neighbors in Orleans that have picked something off. And um, also, how do we use that data to collaboratively go after foundation dollars or grant dollars? And then I'll just end with one of the things we're excited about that we know we've um, already started working on thanks to some of the work Paul is doing with our chamber, and I see Tony Leak is not here, but some of those folks, they've connected us. So we're gonna be doing some, doing some co-branding of our Ready Start Network with Sesame Street um, and their community um, work. And it's really about helping families understand about what constitutes quality in early childhood, how to access it, but co-branding so that you know, Big Bird captures the family's eye, but then they see the Jefferson Ready Start right next to Big Bird, those types of things. So we're super excited about that as well and see all that work happening in the end. I just love those ideas, that's great. Any final words, Ms. Franklin? I'd just like to say that uh, with us, we're getting ready to do a retreat and we're still working on the tier two uh, participants, the stakeholders that we want to bring to the table. We've had some conversation and we have our network meeting tomorrow about making fatherhood a big piece of the Ready Start Network, where we will be including the fathers and the fatherhood movement in, into that, uh, and into Ready Start. So we're excited about that. We know we have some challenges ahead for us, but we just want to be methodical and make sure that when we have a final product with Ready Start St. Mary. That is something that everybody in the state and the nation will be proud of. Awesome. Well, this is just a one, you know, representation from four networks. We have three others that are very strong and underway with their ideas. We have the six additional cohort two networks. So hopefully we can come back to you with additional information. Any other questions before we close? I'd like to just ask yeah. a question. Uh, I'm Jimmy Easterly, I'm on the Bureau of Family Health, Maternal, Infant, and Early Childhood and Visiting Program. So uh, our work is very similar. Uh, we're all in this together. So I'm wondering if you'd be interested in having additional thought partners at the table. I think, uh, you know, with any of these groups, we have, in every single parish that you represent, we have home visitors that go out and work in, uh, with pregnant and parenting families, birth to five, and I would love, love, love to join efforts. St. Mary would love to have you. <laughs> <laughs> I will definitely um, let you know. So, can I connect with you guys? That'd be fantastic. Okay, great. And there's Thank are other people around the table that might be interested in joining us in that network. Yeah. Yeah. So,
question because this is from the email from from the last day. Take just a second, because this is being broadcast and people are watching it all over the state. Define exactly what Ready Start is. For me, exactly because we have the networks, and now we're doing Ready Start. And that is the question that because it's not well, as well known throughout the whole state. And since we are broadcasting this, if you would just take that time, because it would stop a lot of email coming to me. Sure. And I would appreciate that. So. Yeah. Uh, so, and it builds into what I was going to say as a closing talk for that panel as well. Um, Ready Starts to me are communities 2.0, or as Sorrentha said, community networks on steroids. <laughs> These are entities, um, which is a phrase I've also used to describe them before. <laughs> These are um, leadership teams for every community in the state that are building, guiding, and rallying people around a vision for what can be true on the number of young children and families we support and serve and how well we serve them. So they are the group that can tell you with fluency how many kids, how many classrooms, of what quality. They are the group that is saying, here's the current state, here's what should be true. Business partners, philanthropy, community, partners in health, let's all come together and be the group. And the most concrete description of this I would give is, um, as I'm sure many of you experience in your job, when I talk to my neighbors, they don't entirely understand what you know the Department of Ed does day to day or what my work is. I want them to know Ready Start. They don't need to know the early childhood team at the Department of Education, but they should know Ready Start. They should know, oh, Ready Start is that thing in Baton Rouge. That's that group that thinks about how do we have really, really, really good early childhood births to five. And when I have a question about screeners, when I have a question about nurse family partnership, when I have a question about is my kid on track to kindergarten, when I have a question about enrollment, whatever it may be, even though Ready Start may not be the person who immediately answers that question, they become the group I know to go to in the same way that if I had um, a question about, um, you know, is my kid ready for fifth grade, I would know to go to my child's teacher or their principal or the school system. Ready Start needs to keep executing the visions that they have, we need to give them the authority to do it, but also to be elevated as an entity that people know and can rally behind, to build the coalition of individuals who are committed to and working on every day expanding access and quality in the state beyond the group here and those you know, most engaged in this work historically. Does that answer your question? It, it does. I, I, my interpretation of this, and my, I should have said my name is Alan Young, I'm a type of facility in um, Mine was, was this is the completion of the networks. Hmm. It's the fulfillment. That's a good way to say and it. It's a full in, in power. Thank you for the setup of asking me to describe it. <laughs> 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 I'm surmising everything you said. Well and it allows the full impact on a local level to directly resolve any issues about uh, access and quality and those things on the local level. So it gives the community the input and buy-in to make it work. Absolutely. Community plans serve more kids better and faster. Absolutely. And thank you for that time because I had been hammered with that question. What is this? What is this? And it's like, okay, then we're just going to throw it out there and get it out there very much. Thank you. charge and I, I do think uh, this is this will be decade long work so I do want to be transparent about that I think this will go um, beyond the point of the commission but yes and of course anybody in this group who wants to help us think and make this better we would be more than happy to convene and have a conversation about that um, 
maybe what we'll do is, and I'll show me through group, but um, if you have interest in going into a deeper conversation about the shape and guardrails of this, if you could just reach out to me directly after, we can pull a smaller group together. And, we, and honestly, we'd love to get everybody's take as we go. We'll keep you updated no matter what, whether this commission is through its course of time or not, but um, would certainly, we need, frankly, your brain power behind us. I just think it would be really helpful, especially for us to get to the advisory council is, is do you approve or not approve, and to have voices from all of the wonderful people on the commission and other experts. Because they, these would be good things that we want to make sure that are in the pool. I wanted to ask a question on the Red Star Network. Let's say I'm a parent, and I see a precious Sesame Street ad, which I would, I think that's a fabulous idea. Um, because it lends such great familiarity. How does that parent get in touch with the Ready Start Network? Does the Ready Start Network have a physical presence? Do they have regular meetings? Do you email somebody there? Like, how does, you know, Sally parent get? So, I'm not sure that there's a need for a physical presence, but more of a, a brand that I think a lot of it will be virtual. So I think Cindy talked about a new website and those kinds of things. Um, and that's part of our work to come is to develop that website and to have a way for families to communicate um, electronically to then get connected because they're not necessarily connecting. And they may want to come to a meeting and certainly all that will be published and they will be invited and welcome. But they may be trying to learn more about the nursing family partnership um, and how do they get connected to that in Jefferson. And that's what we are, uh, I see the network doing. So the brand is so that they know there's one place to go, but that one place has a mechanism to get you to the different services that you're asking. I'm very happy to hear that because I ask this question all the time about how parents connect with these services. And as well, if you go to our website, there's a tab on the far right, a drop down menu, and nobody's gonna get there. Um, so if it's a Facebook ad that somebody sees that says, has Big Bird on it and Ready Start Network, and they click on it, and they can send you a message and say, I'm pregnant and I need to look for childcare services, that to me is how you're accessible to those parents. So I, I, I appreciate you saying that, thank you. I also just, I agree with all of that, and I would add on, I think, as Ready Start's uh, become as a thing, as I have taken to say internally, that is elevated um, all the good work that's happening. I think it is it is a hub for parents, but it also becomes a hub for pediatricians, for school system employees that are maybe less connected to early childhood, for business and industry that's trying to think about, gosh, I have too many employees missing work and I'm not sure what to do about that. Who can help me think strategically about it? And I think those entities also then have a bunch of touch points <coughs> for individuals who most need the service to help bridge together so that the web ends up being, you know, no wrong point of entry, but this group can help you point to the right person. Um, Jess, so one other question around governance, and this may sort of kind of tease itself out in those work groups, but, you know, again, when we've got child care at the table, Head Start, school system, I feel very comfortable with our group in Jefferson, but for those who don't, the last thing we want to do, and we know Louis Stoney has talked numerous, a ton, numerous times about this, how in, you know, Monique and I's industry, three and four year olds are where we sort of leverage our funding, right? I have a one to four ratio in an infant classroom, but a one to 10 ratio in a three year old classroom. We don't want to put ourselves in a position where the school system begins to take those three and four year olds that we need to survive. I can't imagine if childcare is at that table that it could potentially happen, but those guardrails again, would you have been into that? Yeah, I, don't, I mean, I don't want to speak for Bessie. Ultimately, Bessie will pass the regulations on this, but uh, department staff would propose um, and desire, and we understand fully, the need for making sure that um, you know, when you hear nationally Universal 4 and Universal 3, that especially as a mother of four-year-old sounds awesome, but if you don't do that in thoughtful ways, you can destroy
enjoy service for zero to two, which is already a space we don't have enough challenges. And so we are acutely aware of the need to make sure, when I say the term diverse delivery, what I mean by that is making sure that you are using strategically three and four dollars in a way that builds sites that can then also serve younger ages to make it affordable. Because the reality is, as Luis talked about last year, I think it was Luis that had that conversation with y'all last year, you know, almost every site that offers an infant or toddler classroom is losing money on that classroom. And this isn't um, entirely money making, but the reality is if we want providers to do the incredibly hard work of providing service for kids and families, they can't be going bankrupt doing it. And so we feel very committed and clear about the need to make sure that we're using the dollars in a way that provides service zero to five and cognizant of the fact that the net positive comes in the threes and fours and the crushing finances come in the zero to two, which is part of why you see 7% surface for zero to two, a third for threes, and 95% for fours. It's not, you know, it didn't happen by mistake, and we've got to take that off. Um, I do just want to end with a couple of uh, thoughts about, from the, I thought Kay's question at the end about where do we go next was very helpful. I want to tell you a little bit at the department about how we're thinking about the next phase of this, and again, we would love to engage any of you um, in supporting specific communities, but also more broadly and just start thinking on this. It continues to evolve and iterate, and we want to make it better and better over time. Um, we are creating what we're calling uh, Get Ready, credit to Nashi Patel for this name. Um, a play on Ready Start. We like to do a lot of plays on names, LA Floor. I mean, yeah, LA Floor, LA B to 3. Now we're Ready Start to Get Ready. But essentially, we're working with the, the remainder of our districts through a planning process that every community has to do, um, every school system has to do for budgeting generally to help them build their blueprint. So we have a lot of communities that are not yet ready for a variety of reasons to go all in and to do all of the work that Sorintha or Almitra is doing, but certainly we can start to coalesce around the specific visions of different communities of imagining, brainstorming, and envisioning what's true now versus what could be true. We want to help people through that process. So we're running this cohort, get ready. Um, and uh, our goal in that is to help people take a slow step into being ready to do this work at greater scale across the state, leaning on and learning from uh, the incredible individuals that you just heard about. So that will happen uh, this fall. They will work through and answer the questions you see here. Again, with the goal being starting to build some momentum and excitement around the long-term play of Madison Parish or Monroe City or Ruston, for example. Um, and you see those timelines here. We will have the next cohort of Ready Start formally apply next March. Um, and the Get Ready cohort is intended to be a lead up to that so that we can walk in with the strongest applications possible for our third wave of um, communities that are ready to step up and follow the great work you just heard about. Any questions about that? Jessica, can you remind us, so if we go back to the last slide, so if I'm a district or I'm a community that is applying, obviously I'm gonna get technical assistance, I'm gonna get guidance, I get to connect with others, that's helpful on its own. What else am I applying? So there are some resources, uh, which I imagine is for the care uh, in some ways. What's the scale of that? You know, it help us sort of understand why somebody who isn't already sort of part there is going to say, yep, ready to do the big lift that is obviously important. Yeah, and uh, our uh, thinking on this is certainly evolving as we think about the broader scale, but in our initial cohorts, uh, they can apply for up to a $100,000 grant per year to build this work, staff it, shape it up, convene in all the ways that they talked about. And then we have used uh, federal grant funding that we secured around quality to bring in communication partners, to bring in strategic planning partners, um, to bring in uh, entities that are expert in local governance and sort of nonprofit work so that um, you know, our team can certainly help on the quality access data side of things, but there are specific expertises that these groups need to really evolve and become the full model of Ready Start. And so we're leaning on a number of entities, um, private, nonprofit, and public, uh, to bring to the table and directly connect them, for example, with Sorrentha so that she can lean on those groups as well uh, as she's building her portfolio herself. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it does. I guess um, to play. Sort of played out technically, it strikes me that 
that amount of, the, the technical assistance could in theory be provided to a community network that said, we want to do this regardless uh, of sort of governance blessing of the DOE or anyone else, um, because it's the right thing to do for our community and we're a set of businesses or whatever else. Um, so yeah, I guess I'm just trying to sort of wrap my head around, it strikes me that a lot of this is doable, the 100,000 obviously is quite helpful uh, for multiple years to help fill in budgetary gaps, so uh, I don't know if there's a question in that, it just strikes me as, uh, strikes me as there's got to be a way to make those resources available to folks who might not necessarily be in a, uh, in a place where the finance is the only reason why they're not doing it, um, and that's probably the point to get ready for. Yeah, and I do think this is a long-term question. I, I do need to learn more, we need to see it further in, but to understand financially how is it sustainable to have the central hub that, like, you know, you can imagine a world where for a small amount of grant or allocation funding each year, they're then pivoting and raising $2 million a year, which makes that investment worth it and gives them the staff capacity to actually be able to go do those things. Um, we're not, I think, yet mature enough fully, and frankly, I think that will probably differ by community size and scope, but um, <coughs> certainly recognize that to get lifted off the ground, it is important to invest uh, some of this federal grant funding to give them some runway and, and room to play with. I have a question, Donna Edwards. Um, just, you, you talked a lot about the branding and you know being able to feel good about that brand. How are you going to sure to make sure there are going to be communities that come in that maybe don't have you know what you all have and the investment that you have with other people, business partners, to secure that that branding is kept and has the integrity that other um, you know throughout the state, right? So I'm just wondering. It's a really that. important question. Yeah, I um, that for us is part of why we've defined the model as we have. So we've said in our mind. Ready starts to do these four things. They have a blueprint, they build a coalition. We have a, um, they build governance and then they fundraise. We have a sort of guidebook, if you will, that lays out what we think in more specifics that looks like. And I think eventually Bessie will likely need to say, we expect over the course of a year, two years, here is how we see Ready Starts moving the needle on access and quality, um, which I think in some ways that becomes the protector of the brand, which is, um, Ready Start in Washington might look different than Ready Start in Baton Rouge, but Bessie has set out an expectation that when you are a Ready Start, you are moving the needle. You are increasing the quality of seats that you have and you are expanding the number of seats that you have specific to the community. Um, and, uh, yeah. So you all will be overseeing a lot of that? But you have the manpower to do that? I think it's um, I think it's likely regulatory oversight, um, much like in the K-12 systems, and then certainly our team will continue to support and lean in where there might be struggles, challenges, um, or disconnects between what Ready Starts are supposed to achieve and what's occurring. But frankly, at this point, um, I have to say the leadership in almost every community across the state, in the community network sort of old version, is really strong. And they are, um, we have incredible educational leaders who have stepped up to guide this. I think the biggest challenge, honestly, is as we ask them to step out of the educational space singularly and to think more broadly as being this hub, how do we help them do that? Because they're building expertise and so are we. And um, so that's the part I'm not concerned about, but most thinking about, because it's, I think, the biggest leap from what we do currently day to day. Start Jefferson, for example, or Ready Start um, Baton Rouge. Um, First Lady Edwards, I took what you meant to be saying, maybe I misinterpreted, but what I thought you meant by that was if Ready Start, I won't name a parish and pick on it, if Ready Start X Parish is kind of struggling, we'll mm -hmm. say, does that then end up hurting Ready Start Jefferson that's right. doing a great job? And I think we need to protect for that, but um, in general, it will be specific, and I hope. You know, their branding and look and feel looks a little bit different, and um, the way they approach that will likely look different. We just used the common name Ready Start. We debated this, actually. The reason we ended up encouraging the common name sort of Ready Start, insert parish name, was because they are so new and unknown. We felt like at least if we just do the Ready Start lean-in, every time Sarintha says Ready Start Jefferson, that sort of 
softly helps Ready Start Rapids because it's creating some momentum around the concept, um, but it does come with the risk that you're naming.
We want to help people building tools and trainings to um, really carry the messages and the, and the great work that they're doing even further. You have the slides in your folder. People on the panel mentioned our name as well. We have been working with the Louisiana Department of Education um, for about a year now. Much of, has been, much of our work has been around the Ready Start networks, um, and we are honored to be part of that effort. Um, as has been mentioned a couple of times, this work, there's, only, there's a handful of states doing this work, um, thinking about considering, learning from, and implementing these local governance models. And so, Again, just so proud to be part of, of that effort here in Louisiana. Um, as Libby mentioned, we are working on the uh, LAB to 3 Commission Toolkit. Um, so this is, again, to increase the communication and uh, consistency and communication of the materials that make it easier for you all to communicate about um, the results of the work to many different stakeholders. So the folks that, the early childhood stakeholders that are part of this work already, but also those other people who are going to be making decisions about early childhood uh, in the coming months, years. Um, and we want you to be comfortable and confident in, in that communication. We know that you are already out there talking about early childhood and your work about the community commission, but uh, we want these, we hope these tools are going to make it easier for you to be advocates for infants and toddlers. So again, consistency and message, we want increased awareness so ultimately the infants, toddlers, and their families have access to quality services and resources that they need. So here is where um, we're going to dive into some, con some of the toolkit content. Um, research tells us that someone needs to hear the same message 11 times for it to truly sink in. And so again, the consistency of those messages and the simplicity of those messages matter um, so that people can remember them. Uh, the toolkit content that you will, um, you have draft talking points in, um, in your packet. We also are planning to create a one pager, um, frequently asked questions, and a power to point template that then you can go and use uh, for presentations and that sort of thing. Um, these are all based off of right now the 2018 Commission Report. So um, again, you'll, you'll get the rest of the materials out before your November meeting. Um, looking at the talking points, I know I saw some of you kind of flipping through some of those already. Um, when looking at the talking points, a couple of things to keep in mind. Um, these, these points cover, again, what the 2018 Commission Report um, talks about in terms of what the Commission is, uh, is asking for, but also why it matters and why people should care about it. It ties into need and positions this as a solution, um, and ties into some of the key messengers, messages about um, stakeholders working together to make all of this happen in the long term. The short talking points at the beginning are conversational. So this, these are talking points you can use whether you're uh, at church or whether you're at a cocktail party or in a meeting or presentation. The more detailed points below can be referenced for specific audiences that just need a little bit more detail. So we just ask that you take a deeper look at these when you have some time. Um, let us know what you think, and hopefully these will be useful when you're out there talking about the commission and, and your work in the report. Okay, so next, you've been wonderful at asking great questions and listening to, to everyone for a couple of hours now. Um, we want to work together and get your input on the Frequently Asked Questions page. Um, so you have a Frequently Asked Questions worksheet in your packet. Um, we just ask, just if you fill any of this out, that you leave it at your table at the end of this meeting. We're going to collect those so we can gather your input on those questions. Um, also want to thank anyone who filled out the online survey. There were some people who added questions about um, waiting list, partnerships, uh, wraparound services, and teacher pay to increase quality. So really great questions that you know are going to come up as we're talking about early childhood to different stakeholders. 
Uh, just a reminder, I know you all know this, frequently asked questions is what well, can be really helpful to have in your back pocket. Um, if somebody gets asked a question that comes up often, or if it's a really difficult question where we need to make sure that everybody is having the same type of answer to it. Um, again, it's not an external document. This is internal to have in your back pocket and something that you can refer to. So on your sheet, we have some questions that we have come up with so far. Um, just take a look at these, and we're going to take a, just a couple minutes and to, to think about some of the questions that, uh, that, that you have, that you've heard that have come up as you're talking about the, the commission. So I want to start with, um, when you're talking about the LAV to free work with your networks, with your colleagues, what questions come up most often? I just want to get a few responses. you 
have the talking points, you have the frequently asked questions in your back pocket, you have the one in the handout and the PowerPoint template to present. Um, how are you going to be an ambassador for infants and toddlers within your networks, talking to folks who um, may May, be, may not know as much as you do about early childhood, but are um, still very important to the decision-making process. Um, once the commission releases the report in January, our hope for these tools can then uh, help you carry the message to those new people that, that don't know as much about early childhood. So in your packet, you have another worksheet. Um, and this is one that you can take home from, for, you can take home, you can add to it, you can refer to it, um, or not, but we, we want you to, again, be great ambassadors for infants and toddlers. Um, so we're gonna take just a few minutes to think about um, influencers or folks who are in your network that you would like to reach out to. Um, these could be other members of the, of the business community, the media, folks in higher education, faith leaders, elected officials, people who, who either are making the decisions or folks who uh, have, the ear, um, have the ear of those who do make those decisions. Uh, we know that most of you, all of you, are influencers yourselves, so these are just other influencers in, in your networks. Also, we ex included some examples of actions. So this is just a little activity. You know, this is, these are things that you do all the time. These are, these are fairly easy for you to do pick up the phone and call someone, write a letter to the editor, but again, thinking ahead about what you're going to do when the, re when the report comes in January. So take a few minutes, we'll ask you to, to share some of the actions and timeline. Just, just take a, about 30 seconds to think about what kinds of things will you do in January. Sure that aligns with 
why this matters to them. It's always important to keep this on the list. Anyone else? Well, we hope that you keep thinking about the actions that you uh, plan to take now or in January when the report uh, hits. I know some of the Ready Start networks are thinking about how they can leverage their uh, their advisory groups, those other stakeholders in the community to uh, have a ripple effect and really elevate the work that the commission is doing here. So uh, again, thank you so much for having me today to present our work. Um, we hope these tools will be helpful for you in the coming months and um, happy to take any questions. So I just had um, to applaud ACS for the work that they have done with they have been so helpful. We had a face-to-face -face with them last week, and there's nothing like face-to-face. -face. But one of the one of the things that they really helped us with was your mapping tool that we took advantage of that helped us in our planning, our strategic planning. Is that going to be a part of the LOB3 or maybe some semblance of it? Because it was very helpful for us as you actually think about how you're going to strategically lay out what your what the work is. That that wasn't something that was originally planned, but we can certainly think about how we can add it into the toolkit um, if that's something that that makes sense for the commission. Um, thinking of, and, and what the, the what the network mapping toolkit that um, Cindy's referring to is um, a tool to, to think through all of the different target audiences. So much like on on the slide that says here are the different types, what are the different, who are the different influencers? This tool lays out um, different categories, so whether it's faith-based or for-profit or non-profit in your communities, in your network, um, that you may, you may not even think about with who are in your network. Um, and um, using, leveraging them as, uh, as, as a way to get the message out as well. I just want to thank Rebecca and, and their team being willing to do this work for us. What we've seen be successful at the Louisiana Apostles to Protect Children is really having one message and making it simple so that people can break it apart and know what it means. And so that when we're going to speak, whoever it may be, whether it's the chamber or it's a legislator or it's another movement shaker, they're hearing the same thing over and over again from different people. And so then they start owning that, that language and then we hear it back to ourselves. And I think that's part of the movement that we have all created in this early childhood community and that this work can help us do. So thank you.
what responsibilities are we going to give to the locals and what responsibilities are we going to keep as a state? And what outcomes are we going to demand from the locals? And what are those metrics that we're going to use to measure those outcomes? Who gets to decide what those metrics are and judge them, et cetera? And to the extent the locals are raising money, which we are going to do everything in our power, I know we've we're working with the department to try to make it so that we can figure out ways that locals can raise money, because I agree, we, this will never be solved at any one level, just like K-12, it's going to take federal, state, local, and private. But who gets to decide how that's money spent? Who's at the table? And how do we protect every provider, every type of provider in that community to have a voice? And every age. Because if we just say, we're, the goal is to expand access to quality early parent education. You could have a community that decides, you know, the easiest way to get there is to have every three-year-old served in the school system. That's an easiest way in a local community right now, probably, to expand access to quality. If that's the metric, expand access to quality early parent education, the easiest way, pass a millage, put every three-year-old in the school system. Sounds good. That's what we did with our four-year-olds, frankly. At the time, there were lots of reasons, and it was the best way to go. We have a fabulous pre-K program. But if you don't think about, well, you'll have no birth or two left if you do that. But that all depends on the metric you're being judged by. So the, the, the articulation of that is huge, which, which Jessica just said. But my, my, my ask of this commission and the advisory council is we all need to be engaged in thinking deeply about who has what responsibility, what infrastructure do they need to be successful? You know, we can just push the responsibility. Act 3 was an unfunded mandate. The, the department and the parties have been amazing at implementing that, but think what we could do if it's actually funded, right? And we have the infrastructure, we need to do a good job. So these are my cautionary tales. The worry board that I am is mom watching everybody now. <laughs> but, um, but truly, y'all, uh, I just, it's such an opportunity now for to think, we need to think really carefully about those things um, because otherwise um, we, we won't be, you know, moving forward as we hope. So my little words of caution, thank you for the opportunity. <laughs> thank you, Marlene. Um, any last comments from the group? I have a question. Thinking about getting a smaller group to Again, I don't think um, we are not planning nor prepared for Bessie to be voting on regulations on Ready Start in the next few meetings. It's too soon. And by the way, there are statewide elections. Just to name the elephant in the room, happening this fall that needs to get through. As everyone is acutely aware, some of you bless you more than others. Um, uh, the number of those in that race who can tell me the exact number of days left is um, my heart is with you. Um, <laughs> I think we need to we need to get through this fall and winter, but we are continuing to have iterative discussions both with the Ready Start leadership that you've heard from as well as internally. And again, if you if you would like to help us engage through that process more, please just reach out to me directly. Um, and depending on level of interest and size of group, we'll figure out how to facilitate that in a timely manner. Either way, we'll continue to keep you updated. We're slated to get together again in November. In that meeting currently, we are planning to discuss, based on your direction from last year, again, we can adjust, of course, but based on what the group told us about, that you wanted to focus on last year, uh, we would like to bring you more information on other places and what they're doing to support all families, including more like broad one-stop shop resources, not just there is a seat at a center that is this quality, um, as well as looking at how it is that um, other states and big cities are funding at scale some of the initiatives that we've talked about. People have taken very different models on this. Policy Institute put out um, a very helpful paper on this last year, uh, but trying to bring <coughs> together some more examples for you all of how we've seen other people build these hubs and fund this work over time. Um, all as a lead up to 
any edits or additions you all will want to make to the commission report from last year. This commission could decide to say the commission report from last year, LAV to three, let's just underline and you know our position is still the same. You may want to make some tweaks and additions to that based on uh, what has advanced in the past year and the things we've learned since then. We will certainly follow your lead on that, but we'll try to bring you some additional information on those remaining two topics in November and then take your guidance about how we bring this to the finish line by January um, in that November meeting. Uh, part of that is certainly Ready Start, but not exclusively. And again, if you, if you want to engage further on either specific topics or Ready Start in particular, please feel free to reach out to me directly. Um, or if you don't have my email address, because my last name is hard to spell, you have the email from Leslie where she sent out all the materials for the meeting. Feel free to also just contact her and we'll bring folks together in the meantime. Um, okay, I need a, a motion to adjourn and a second. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Monique. And we will see y'all in November. Thank you. Thanks, you too. Thank you so much.